So today's talk is called Your Service is Not Open Source. And in many ways, it's a longer version of what we talked about at the keynote yesterday. Um, there's more room for discussion. Maybe some of you have had time to think about aspects of this, and we can go into more detail on some of the more interesting areas here. Um, I see Tomas is in the chat room, Tomas Tomaszek. He's put together some of these slides. And um, he's, of course, welcome to join me. We can also sometimes direct questions at him. And uh, let's get started. So why am I talking about this topic? This topic is relevant because I care a lot about open source. Um, I've worked in open source for the last 20 years and been, just like many of you, one of the contributors to this movement that has changed the world. Um, one of the things that I did was contribute to a hundred different projects, all sorts of different ones. Um, a lot of GNOME projects, but also tons of different um, infrastructure. Uh, sometimes the, the FreeBSD kernel, I used to contribute there, PostgreSQL, OpenLDAP, Kerberos. Um, in many cases, you'll find that my, my contribution to a project or another is a small one. A few, a few patches here, a few patches there. And this was all done with the goal of making things work together really well, something that I care a lot about. Um, making different projects with different goals and different timelines and different people look to the user like they're part of one bigger whole. And so fixing these small issues that allow things to work seamlessly together has been my passion. In many ways, um, I, uh, I, I also was one of the, the main contributors to Cockpit. We worked on that and started up that project and it brought together a whole bunch of different APIs, a whole bunch of different components. Um, this is an old list, but it's, I think it's over 90 and talks to all these different APIs and components and files uh, and commands and so on directly. This meant going into many of these projects either myself or one of my, my team members, one of the project members, and, co and contributing something there. And it's safe to say that because we were fluent and enabled to go and become contributors in all of these different projects, we were able to be successful. Without that capability, Cockpit would not exist. Each project is different. Each project has different uh, requirements, different timeline, different culture, um, different uh, uh, languages, different standards, different quality. It's, it's, a, it's a vast uh, uh, collection of, of, different, um, of different ways to contribute. But one thing is consistent. Open source projects allow users of those projects to become contributors. And they all allow this in one way or another. Open source thrives because it converts users into contributors. A small, small percentage of the people who can use a project, who run it, um, uh, who experience it in some way, decide, hey, I want to change something. And they figure out that they can, and they become a contributor. If you take away this function, open source starves. And so not only have we been able to build such amazing things on the fact that you can contribute to all these projects. The fact that we can bring things together, the fact that we can bring thousands of projects together into a single Linux distribution um, is an amazing fact. And it's powered by the fact that we can contribute to all these things. But on the other hand, if we start to see this trend reverse, I am concerned that this part of all of our legacies where, where we have changed the world in this way will start to starve. So here's an example. Um, I'm a small time PostgreSQL contributor. A while back, I added a feature and I made a few bug fixes for because I was experiencing some problem when running it. And um, this community was an amazing example of an open source community that not only was very welcoming, not only was very competent, but was also made me successful as a contributor. They helped me get started through documentation. Their process for evaluating my change, reviewing it, 
giving me feedback on it um, and making sure it was on their list every week in their discussions and kept me up to date on how to participate and everything turned me into a successful contributor of Postgres. Um, if you look at Amazon RDS, you'll notice that Postgres is being run there. And you'll, you, can, you can actually look up different reasons why you would use Postgres on, on RDS. And you can get all these amazing lists of the things that you get when you do that. Things like, obviously, backups, backup and restore, high availability, replication, infrastructure, performance tuning, monitoring. I mean, you name it. All these things you would have to figure out if you ran Postgres on your own. Uh, and that's very compelling. I totally get why a bunch of people want to consume Postgres as RDS. Makes total sense. Someone else can deal with all of that. And I can focus on what's important to me, which is using Postgres, putting my data there, um, structuring the data appropriately, um, and, and, all, and using all of its features. However, when run as a service like this, as RDS, there is no mechanism for a user or some small portion of the users to become contributors. And as more and more people consume software in the, in a, as a service, in this way, this has me worried, has, makes me feel threatened, makes me feel threatened that open source is going to starve in relation to how many people use um, software as a service, use some of these same projects as software as a service. And for a long time, this concerned me. And you know, I was very uneasy about services. And despite the fact that I and my teams different people I know run services, this was this thing that was, it seemed very hard to reconcile in my head, the fact that this seemed to be a threat for open source. Um, if we look at, uh, at, this is just a fictitious path of someone, of a user um, of open source software, figuring, taking the various steps, the various stages that you need to get from user to contributor. And on the left-hand side, we have open source software. On the right-hand side, we have software as a service. So, you know, at the beginning, you see the user would uh, be using the software all happily and then figures out, hey, wait a second, I can do better. This, this, this thing over here needs to be changed. It needs a fix. The first big obstacle is realizing that you can contribute if it's open source. Um, a lot of people will just walk away. They don't even... It doesn't even make sense to them that they can contribute to this thing. Second is figuring out which code to change. If you've used a complex project like, uh, well, like GNOME or uh, anything that's running a bunch of microservices or Kubernetes or, or anything really, figuring out which code to change is a tough, a tough task. Being able to tweak something, change something, and understand that your changes are having an effect on what's running. Then figuring out how to run it, how to build it, how to make it actually work, um, how to make your change take effect, how to experience it. Then usually you break the, the thing. And a lot of people give up at, at every one of these stages. They give up. They're like, oh, it's not worth trying to contribute. And then you go down further um, with less and less people sticking, sticking with you. They've managed to get the change fixed, make it functional. And hey, it works. It solved my problem. Um, now, how can other people use my change? Everyone should have this. And by and by, at each of these stages, it's an obstacle. But eventually, you get some contributors out of this. Some contributors are like me, might come by the project, work with, work with it for a little while, and then move on. But some people become also routine contributors to a certain project and become its maintainer and so on. So this should seem obvious to you. On the right-hand side, we have software as a service. And you can see that many of the things <laughs> that we many of the techniques that are typically used to overcome these obstacles do not exist. Um, we lose the users who could be contributors very rapidly, and it dwindles to almost nothing. And so how do we solve this problem? And why is this a problem in the first place? Let's look at some of the fundamentals behind this, some of the first principles that we would need to think about. So one of the first principles is that open source thrives because it can, can move some percentage of users to contributors. Um, but let's look at others. So what is a service? A service is more than just the code, more than just software. I mean, 
obviously very prominently in the service is the software that's, that's running. And even the operational code, if the people running the service have any muster, they, they're, they're encoding their operations um, in, in various forms and various techniques and various playbooks or, or um, Kubernetes operators or, or what have you, and actually um, automating a lot of the operations that turns into code. But beyond that code, there's a lot of other things going on here. There's infrastructure it's running on, there's other users, there's backups, there's scaling, there's disaster recovery process, there's legal agreements about data, there's interconnected services that provide perhaps authentication or other aspects um, to the service. There's tools that are integrated, logs, there's performance tuning, high availability, you name it, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I probably missed a bunch of stuff here as well. So a service is much more than just an instance of the code that's running. Once you bring in all of this, it has sufficient complexity that it's much more like an organism. And leads, leads to this claim. Open sourcing your code is insufficient to make an open source service because a service is way more than just code. Open sourcing the operations that's operational code is insufficient to make an open source service. It's necessary. Both of these steps are necessary. You would not call your service open source if you didn't open source your software or your operational code. And, and, uh, and you see services, for example, that only open source their code. An example is Travis has all of its code on, on GitHub. Um, and yet it's hard to say that Travis is open source. Um, no one knows how that all comes together. It's very difficult. Um, other projects have open sourced part of their operations, like uh, GitLab, for example. Um, it shares the operational, uh, it lets you spawn up uh, its own instance, basically the setup and deployment scripts and a whole bunch of different other aspects of the operational code so that you can run it. But even this is insufficient, I claim, to make an open source service. And this is because the users of the service, they explicitly chose not to be involved in the operations when they chose to use software as a service. And so forcing them to operate the service as a way of contributing to run their own is ex explicitly counter to the choice that they made. Go back to that RDS example with Postgres. The user of RDS explicitly chose not to be involved in the operations of Postgres. And therefore, if in order to convert that user to a contributor, they have to go back on that decision, you're gonna have a very low success rate. And what's more is that the service is sufficiently complex, all of those various attributes coming together, that it's not reproducible. Here we have two twins, both from the same source code, the same DNA, identical at some point. And yet you can see how rapidly they diverge. At one point, these twins may well become enemies, who knows? But all of the other attributes that come on top of the source code, on top of what defines it, makes these into different entities, different characters. If you clone a service fully and bring in all those other aspects again, we saw in that word cloud, um, you will have a different service. And much of the value of the service comes not from the software itself, but from all, it comes from the operations and then everything that goes along with it, all of its interconnected web with everything that's running. So, thus we reach this conclusion. And it is a challenge. The challenge is that a user of an open source service can discover which component to contribute to in that running service make a nonsensical change to a service that is running. For example, add a printf style log statement or change the spelling of something and experience that change when using the existing service or when it's accessing their data or when, uh, when, when they're sending workload to it. I mean, they're a user. So they experience the change that they've made. Iterate on that change till it's useful. Obviously, we're not gonna merge a, a uh, change of spelling just for fun, and then propose it for merging. And, uh, and there should be a way that communities interacting with an open source service, groups of users, 
groups of contributors, can share changes, can stabilize new behavior, and can work together on different aspects, different functions, uh, functionality in the service before everyone else experiences that new functionality or those new changes. And this might seem like quite a, quite a crazy goal. It really implies that, hey, we should be running people's random changes or their, their pull requests in the service. Um, and I mean, the mind boggles with all the po all possible things that could, could go wrong here. How would you do such a thing? The thing is, when we sat down and thought about this, it became clear that all of the techniques that we need in order to pull this off, we already have today. There's already someone doing each aspect of what's necessary to pull this off. What's more is that there is a simple iterative path that gets you from the comfort where you are today running your service, the standard techniques you're familiar with, to this goal. It's possible. And so as an example, um, we would take you on such a journey. There are some projects that are going on this journey. Some of them have taken first steps of this journey and then they have, uh, then they have stopped. Some, some are explicitly deciding to go all the way through this journey towards having a contributable open source service. So um, there, this is all available in text form, by the way. Let's take a look. Um, I'll, I will click a, a link here at the end of my uh, my slides, and we can bring it up in the in the uh, in a tab as well. So just a second, there we go. Um, and actually, I'll paste this if you'd like to follow along here in the chat. So, um, and and you know, this is this is an imaginary uh, playbook. Some projects are doing various steps here. But there's certain parts that we're not familiar with. It goes from the comfortable to the uncomfortable, from the known to the unknown. So let's start. So the first thing that you need to do, you have a, you have a standard, a, a, a decent project, um, a decent service that's using CI, that's documented, that's using pull requests, that's using all the standard techniques um, that you have in modern software development. And one of, the, one of the most important things, and this is something that's often neglected, but many of you are familiar with already, is you have to document your deployment workflow. Document it, make sure that, uh, that uh, it's understandable, that other people can do it. Have someone else sit down, for example, and walk through, maybe, maybe someone who's just joined your team or, or a new contributor to your service, and walk through uh, this, this uh this documentation and actually deploy another instance of your service. Um, next, automate that. Make sure it happens continuously. You would, you would run that automation against a staging infrastructure. Again, there's nothing new here. Many of you, I hope, uh, in this room running services already do this. You have a staging infrastructure where you take new batches of changes, perhaps before they're released into production, and you push them out into staging. Um, and, you, and, and contributors or, or users are working in that area and making sure that those, those changes are um, you know, sane. You give them some testing, you give them a runaround before you deploy them into production. If you get stuck here, it's a very awkward place to get stuck because there's that big risk factor when you deploy something from staging into production. Can it all go bump in the night because it's a big batch of changes that have piled up and they haven't really seen the light of day yet. They've been having some fake workload hit them. They fall past CI and so on. And you've reviewed them well, but it's still like a scary moment every time you batch this stuff from staging into production. And the longer you wait to, to, to make that transition, the scarier it gets. So the continuous aspect of this is quite vital. But again, we're on familiar ground here, nothing revolutionary, nothing magical. Let's move on. So what many projects do next, and I think this is important, is to take some traffic, have some people actually use your staging environment for real. This implies some steps, such as making sure that your, your production and staging can access the same data, um, that they can have the same experience when using staging, except for only the changes in behavior that, that people have contributed or the team has worked on. 
the project has worked on and are not yet available in production. In fact, um, there's, there's many, many examples of people doing this. This is not that amazing or insane, but it's important, of course, to make sure that the people using staging, um, perhaps going to a different URL uh, for that service, um, are getting the real experience. They're not using, they're not working with fake data. They're not working with fake uh, um, uh, behavior, but they're actually getting the proper experience. They're authenticated as real users and so on and so forth. So this is typically the next step we go through. And off we go. Now, here's the key part is turn your staging more into a canary or AB deployment where you route some of your traffic, you shard your workload in some way and send part of it to staging. You might have a very intelligent map that says certain users requests go to staging to experience that, that different behavior. Um, or you might have it based on workload. You might have it based on a certain other criteria. If the contributors, oftentimes this is a team, um, can, can update that definition of what goes to staging, they're able to switch stuff between production and staging, switch their workload, switch their behavior between the two. And moving on ahead, we can see that this gives us the capability to have N deployments. N deployments that um, each have different functionality. We see our production, our staging there, where a lot of the traffic goes. But we also start to see the ability to have deployments for pull requests that are not yet merged, for features where groups of contributors are working on something together and getting it ready, um, and, and, and putting their real workload through there to ensure that this feature works the way they intended to and stabilizing it. Um, and so far, we've, we've, we've kind of focused on many of the deployment mechanisms and how you, might, how you might pull this off, but we're getting kind of suspiciously close to the ability for an outside contributor to come in and actually propose a PR. Now, there are several steps after this. They are somewhat unfamiliar. We need to apply techniques that, that do some code review before a contributor can randomly um, you know, route some traffic to their PR. We would need to have some interaction on making sure that it's about that the, the code is evaluated that's not leaking data or it's not doing destructive tasks and so on. But many of these things are already available. I mean, th these techniques are already used in one way or another in projects. Many projects, for example, um, will do a code review before passing a test through CI to ensure that it's not a Bitcoin miner or it doesn't you know, break the CI infrastructure. Um, and that's an example. There are also other places where um, certain deployments, certain DevOps or SRE techniques require uh, rigor around data, separation of persistence. And there's, there's, there's many places where when confronted with a problem, we can either use an open source technique or an existing um, operational technique to solve that problem. And so far, as we've discussed this and looked at these kinds of things, um, we haven't found a particular obstacle that someone hasn't already figured out an answer for. They just haven't used them all in this way to enable contributions from uh, people outside or in, in combination together. But I'm uh, reasonably certain, at least so far, the data is showing that we can actually use existing techniques to pull this off. So again, the challenge. The challenge is if you run an open source service, how do you get to the point where you can have a contributor, like maybe you're running part of the services uh, in Fedora, or you're running services um, using a, using a, a project that that has that, uh, that that other people can run themselves. But how do you um, make it so that a user can discover that your service is contributable? A um, and that hey, here's the pieces of it. Here's the map of the microservices that. That, that they're involved and, and how to find the place where they need to, where you know, they could contribute, they can make a change. Make that nonsensical change. That's often the first step to a contributor. It's just understanding that, hey, I can change something. It might be just figuring out the, the, anything, like we said, log or spelling or anything like that here. And then have them experience that change. Um, have them experience it when they're accessing the service or by a staging environment, like we talked about, these are all different steps towards this goal. Um, be able to make more changes there and um, 
at, at the end when it's ready, propose it for merging. And then of course, for it, it advanced, the, you know, advanced part of this challenge, how do people share changes that are not yet merged into everyone's behavior? This is fundamental. We've depended in open source on this very staged approach where I make a change, I run it on my own computer, it doesn't explode, then I share it with others. Um, and they try it out and they review it and they, try, they work on it. Then it might go into a, a project that, that other people are tracking. Then it goes into a distribution. Uh, Fedora, as it said, as, as they like to call them, as the Fedora likes to call itself, it's a cutting edge distribution. So trying to get as many recent changes there as possible. Then it goes to more stable places and so on. That entire thing is missing. Um, those, all those steps are missing when working with services. And this, this is kind of the end goal of that, where you have communities that are able to work together like this. Um, there are examples of people, uh, projects pursuing this. I, Packet has talked about this, that Packet is on this journey of making sure that the Packet service is contributable. It's not all the way there, but it is taking those steps along. There are many other, Pagure does it too. I hear from Neil. Awesome. Um, I saw a, a SIG or like a, a, a proposal for, for, for implementing some of this in Pagure that someone linked the other day. So, and, and like I said, many projects are on this road uh, or services are on this road at some point. And so it's about taking that next step towards this destination where, um, open, where users can become contributors without becoming operators. They can contribute to a running service and actually work in that way. So here's two links. What the first one is about uh, operate first. It's an effort to make sure that we codify and share and open source all of our um, operational code, our operational expertise. And the second one is more of a scratch pad that I put up with this challenge some of the playbooks related to it, some of the steps you might take. And I'm hoping that we can, we can work together in places like that. Maybe the playbook that's written there so far is, you know, it's, it's off. Um, there's something, you know, there might be different models for how we do this, different techniques and tools and so on. And so I'm looking forward to all of the different projects that are interested in working together on this, um, and many are. Um, to see how we can share our knowledge, share what worked and didn't work, and actually come up with some uh, with some best practices here. All right, so we're ready for Q and A in the last twelve minutes. And so, if I understand this correctly, oh, hi, Justin. Hey, Steph. Uh, would you like me to read the questions, or do you uh, can you see them? Um. I can see them. Okay. Uh, I see two questions so far. So the first one is GitLab has parts, some parts of their operational stuff open source, but the code that is that their service runs on is open, is I guess not open source. Is that uh, is that what you meant, Neil? It is it really workable with the open core model that they use? Yeah, GitLab is a bit tricky. So they they are open core, and that is a ding. On the other hand, they are, they are effectively, well, at least more effectively than other services, accepting contributions. So what they have, even though they don't let you run, um, they, don't, they don't give you the entire operational side of their service. Um, what they do give you is this thing called the GDK, the GitLab Development Kit, that allows you to start up pretty easily GitLab on your own, essentially have your own development environment. So if, if you met, if you plot them on this on this model or in this playbook, they definitely are somewhere along this road. And for the people, for the developers, um, given that GitLab is something that a lot of companies or a lot of uh, projects run themselves, um, and so a lot of the people who are touching it are operationally minded, it does seem to be working. It does seem to be working that uh, that some of those are turning into contributors. They have they have numbers that show that. And we can't deny that part. I, I, th I do believe, though, that if you do go down this road and have real open source services that people can contribute to actively without forcing them to fork or clone this entire and, and run and operationalize this entire service, 
that you will have a, a community built around the running service and a center of gravity that 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 removes the need to jump to crutches like open core once you have that kind of center of gravity around your service you won't need to go to open core you won't need to be afraid of holding some part of it back so that other people can't run it because you have a whole bunch of contributors there actively participating actively um, working together on different behavior and, and moving the service forward. And so the clonability of it, you can't clone that kind of activity. And the clonability of it, as we said before with a service, is not really possible. You get a facsimile or a different behavior in the service when you clone it. Um, so the second question is how you can make business with open source software or libraries. That's a, that's a complex question. Um, and I guess it, it's sort of outside the scope of what we're talking about here. I did touch on it a bit with the open core model. Um, but there is another aspect that often comes up. So if I may, I may answer a, a business question that comes up when talking about this topic of open source services. And that is, how do you pay for um, all of those extra deployments? How do you pay for the fact that other people can come and use the service and contribute to the service. And this goes back in my mind to that simple function that open source thrives by taking users and turning them into contributors. In other words, you had those users in the first place and you were paying, you were somehow making a business, your service was either worth it, was funded, or your infrastructure was funded and you were somehow um, in some cases, um, uh, running, if it's an open source service, you might have been, someone may have been donating the, the infrastructure, or there may be may, maybe other aspects in play, but somehow you were servicing those users already. Now the question, the challenge is, how do you turn them into contributors? Not how do you, you know, it's not a wasteful activity there. And of course, as we do that, we must be mindful about deploying those deployments in such a way that they scale, that they don't each double the cost of running the service. But there are many techniques, um, whether it's running projects in Kubernetes and pods, or whether it's um, uh, uh, using different tiers of infrastructure that allow this to be a nonlinear uh, explosion of costs. Question from David, Duncan. Ah, so constraining the legal and terms of service problems is something you keep in the scope of the outsider. I'm looking at 10.3 and 10.5 on the services. You keep the activity human. What do you mean by 10.3 and 10.5? Are those slide numbers? Let me see. You could answer in the chat um, if we want to have a dialogue. So um, as you can see, this playbook goes first focuses on people who you trust usually team members, and achieving much of the advantages uh, here for easy contribution for those people first. And then it punts towards the end some of, OK, how do you make everyone be able to contribute? These are things that, that we do need to uh, look at. Um, but the, the legal and terms of service related to other people contributing, other people, for example, hosting content that, uh, that is not legal in your jurisdiction, or, um, and then being, if they do, being banned from being a contributor. Uh, many projects have this. Um, for example, if you, if you go to GitHub and sign up, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have to uh, sign a terms of service and so on. So there's those aspects there that definitely need to be, we need to have a, a common best practice for, for some of them um, uh, in, order to, in order to complete this playbook. There are some other aspects to, to, to legal aspects or, um, for example, uh, interconnections with other services, agreements with other services, and so on that are out of scope of this. Because you're running, you're, you're contributing to an existing running service, um, it's not necessary for every contributor to involve themselves in every agreement that perhaps, for example, a service has with the with another service that's authenticating, that's providing authenticating authentication to it or providing backups to it or providing um, some portion of the service that's interconnected. Those are out of scope because the contributor doesn't need to launch an entire service all over again and doesn't need to be involved in all of those aspects. 
So we'll be, I'll be putting up together with some of my co-conspirators like Tomas, hey, we'll be putting up some more content on these pages and for example, tracking where different projects are in the maturity model, or maybe they're taking a different approach to this, but correlating information here. And I really hope that um, as we do that, we will find the models that most projects can use to achieve this challenge and that we can, we can actually pull off effective contributions um, on services and thus have true open source services.